So we already heard, uh, listened to Jonathan yesterday. So I will present it shortly today. He's retired from the Open University, where much of the time he has been a uh, LaTeX official. And uh, this uh, Open University is the UK's largest provider for distance learning. It has many disabled students, and hence the talk of Jonathan uh, today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here on the third day of the conference. I'm very grateful for everybody that's made it the success it has been. Um, and I'm going to talk about access and accessibility. Uh, the main part of this talk, the, the filling of the sandwich, will be some case studies. In other words, events that have happened that we can learn from. Some of them are concrete and some of them are abstract. And the padding on either end, the bread and butter, if you like, will be access and accessibility and, so to speak, more um, conceptual stuff. So I'm going to start with the Chaffee Amendment, which is an amendment to US copyright law. And it's really wonderful because it means that somebody working in the Office of Student Support in a small college in Oregon who has a visually impaired student they're supporting can scan and OCR copyrighted material and provide it to the print disabled person. And if there are tools available for dealing with the mathematical material, they can do the same for print mathematics. Now, the Chaffee Amendment is a law. And laws are things that can be enforced by courts. And to enforce by court, you need a claimant. And in this case, the claimant would be the print disabled person or the person providing education to the print disabled person. And they have a defense regarding copyright. So the law talks about you're allowed to translate it to accessible formats exclusively for print disabled persons. That gives you the legal right, but it doesn't define what accessible is. That's not a legal thing is something that's tr tried in a court with expert witnesses, for example. Now, the Chaffee Amendment promotes a social good of equality of access, and in particular, it promotes access to information for persons with disabilities. So that's the difference between accessible and access. Here's the producer experience. We're producers. Here's a number of statements. Accessibility is very important to us. We have an accessibility policy. We have an accessibility team. All these things, statements I've made have got a different meaning depending on the tone of voice and the experience you've had in the past. But there are other statements. Do disabled persons use our products? How many? Is there equality of access? And those are the things that the court might be interested in. A defense saying our product is accessible won't work if there's not equality of access and there's a legal requirement for equality of access. The user experience is different. As a verb, access means enter a place. It also means use or get a tool or a thing. Is there wheelchair access? There's an international symbol for that. Can I use this product or am I died? denied? By the way, uh, denial of access is a problem when access should be allowed. An allowance of access when it should be denied is a security bug. The computer says no, that's a catchphrase in one of our TV programs in the UK. Does it work with the screen reader? Help, I can't use a mouse. Some people have got arthritis, they can't use a mouse. They have to use a keyboard, they are sighted. So computers want access to, inf computer users want access to information and services. Now, this is leading up to Jonathan Godfrey, who is a blind senior lecturer in statistics in New Zealand. He's the first blind senior lecturer in statistics in the whole world. He has a lot of experience and he contributes a great deal. 
and he says we need we the blind people need access to information much more than we need access to a specific file format and he's going to keep on saying that he says now as tech community producing pdf which is a file format is our strength and i would say notwithstanding our previous talk which is improving matters providing access to information is our achilles heel so we have to be aware and we have to beware that we don't become excluded because we can't provide access to information so i spent the past two years meeting a lot of users and the first place i sort of go is I go to the blind math list, which is largely for people in education, and the visually impaired programmers list, which is largely for people who are programming or learning to program. I learned from the VI programmer list that VS Studio from Microsoft is very widely used and highly regarded because they have a very strong accessibility team. So if you want to meet the users, those are good places to go. Just hang out on the lists. So the first case study, comes from one of the TUG mailing lists, the accessibility list. And it took place this year, and I've paraphrased it. Jason White, who provides accessible outputs, works in the United States, is using LWAR, which is a LaTeX2 HTML tool for conversion. And he wonders if there's LaTeX markup for header sales in a table. Why does he want that? Because the screen reader needs it, or is programmed to need it, to distinguish tables that are there for layout and tables that are there because they're tables. It looks for table headers, header cells as a semantic. Um, Ulrike, Ulrike Fisher said that it's a good question, hard to solve, paraphrase. Uh, I produced a simple row header syntax for this. Um, out of the blue, Alex Watson wrote to Brian Dunn, I've got this well, L walk patch for you, is it okay? I was copied in on this. There was testing and refinements, and now there's a new version of L walk that's been uploaded to CTAN. Uh, I haven't had confirmation that Jason White's problem is solved, but we certainly made progress, and I've learned a little along the way too. Um, there's a lot of things you can learn from a case study that I haven't told you. So for example, none of this took place on GitHub or on an issue tracker, and some of it took place through private emails. That might be good, it might not be that good, but it's part of the issue, it's part of the case study. So that's the first case study. The next one came up during this very conference. You just have to keep your eyes open. And these are statements from experienced tech users on one of the TUG mailing lists. Why is there tech source in the TUG abstracts web page? Several people have reported this, it's being fixed. As tech users, we're used to reading tech code, and this is the best for blind users. I thought for blind HTML better than tech source. The tech source would confuse sighted novices, improve the HTML or talk convert text source to PDF. These are just statements that people have made. I've not attributed to them anybody. If you work hard, you'll be able to find them on the internet and identify the people that said them, I'm sure. But um, we can learn something from that. Now, this one's, this one's my favorite. Um, you have to eat your own dog food. So this is, this slide in this presentation. I want you to read the first three lines and the last line, and then there will be a magic trick. So disabled access for this slide in this presentation is that you have access to the information on the current slide and audio feed from the person presenting. But my question is, what else is required? Now for the magic trick, if I can pull it off. Pretend you're blind. Blind people can't see. 
you can't see the slide that was there previously. That makes you blind. Now, why is this important? Well, what I'm doing now is that I'm looking at the previous slide because I've got it in front of me. I'm doing this deliberately. It's something that no good presenter should do unless they've got a reason to do it. But if you're a blind person reading in, read, participating in this presentation and you don't have a braille display, which are quite expensive and they're also noisy, then the screen reader and the audio feed are competing for your attention. And so as the user, you will switch from one to the other. You can't switch your attention from your eye to your ear because the eye doesn't do anything. It has to be from your eye it have to switch from one audio source to another. That's why braille readers are so useful because the ears can keep processing the sound and the fingers can keep processing the braille. So each switch interrupts the other and there's a cost. The eye ear cost, which is what I'm dealing with, is much less than the touch ear cost cost, which is probably substantially less than the ear ear cost. I'll restore your sight. So I'm hoping that you're now better able to understand what else is required. You do need two accessible street streams, of course, but to provide rough equality of access, You've got to handle the disparity between eye ear change of focus to ear ear change of focus. You've got to compensate for that. You've got to provide an adaptation. And the difficult thing, I think, is realizing that you need that adaptation. And um, also you have to be more aware of the cognitive burden. Blind people, generally have to manage with higher levels of cognitive burden. So here's what I think this one solution is. You provide two streams, which are the information, and what I call a focus switch navigator, which gives you access to the information, and it has to be on a familiar platform, which I think will probably be a web browser or something like Visual Studio Code. And it would be most comfortable on a platform that the, the user uses, and different users might use different platforms. Now, I mentioned the Open University at the beginning. The Open University has a lot of disabled students, and the Open University provides remote learning. The two are linked, because the one place where a disabled student is at home and where everything is accommodated for him and all the special provisions are required, will be at home, I hope. And so studying from home means that the wheelchair problems, all manner of other problems, transport problems, um, perhaps special equipment problems, perhaps people have got um, all manner of disabilities, some of which are hidden, but somebody might have, um, Fatigue is uh, something like ME, that's a disability. And as, 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 so they need a difference, they need a more supportive environment. Whatever it is, oh, by the way, this also applies to people who've got caring responsibilities as well as people who are being cared for. So they will have their favorite tools. And to say this is accessible provided you use this web browser or you use this tool, um, might be a bad idea and you certainly have to think very carefully about those things which is why I wrote on a familiar platform and now for us as producers of presentations with Beamer it means that our Beamer stuff has to communicate not only as video if we want it to to the sighted people but has to communicate as information as Jonathan Godfrey taught it called it, to the visually impaired people in a way in which they can manipulate it and access it, 
And moreover, they have to do it paired with the audio stream. Now, if they're hearing the presentation on something like YouTube, they might want to pause the audio stream, go over to the slide, look more through that with the screen reader, go back to the um, video. And this toing and froing, which we can do very easily with our eyes from one window to another, and that's exactly what I'm doing now. And one eye is looking at my slides and the other side is looking at what's happening on Zoom. Uh, is a different matter for the disabled people, visually disabled people, and we mustn't impose a burden on there that we can avoid imposing. We try and reduce those burdens. So that's why I said be aware and beware, because typographic excellence in this environment won't work if it doesn't fit the platform, and we don't control the platform. And I hope it's the visually impaired, the disabled person, who ultimately controls the platform. That's a bit of a speech I've given. Here's another case study. It's actually related to the one about the code in the um, tech abstracts uh, for this conference. So, and I've been caught on this. So preprints on the archive.org have an abstract. In fact, most of them have two abstracts. They have one on the HTML page and one in the PDF and often they don't agree because perhaps the user has used has put in has used macros when typesetting and copies and pastes that stuff into the form that archive provides when you submit and it's got macros that mathjax doesn't understand or maybe it has constructions that mathjax doesn't understand so there's all manner of ways in which archive abstracts in the HTML are not correct. I'm gonna suggest that this is a problem we can solve because it's 2022 and can't we do this now? We need a triple view editor. We have source, HTML, PDF views, make it available as a web page. If it's available as a web page, then it can be a, a part of the archive submission process. It could be an optional part in terms of, please check your um, web abstract before you submit. That would be enough. You're, asked to, you, you're more or less forced to check your PDF before you submit and ask, giving people the opportunity to check their uh, HTML form of the, arc of the abstract would be great. And this, I think, would be the thin end of the wedge for introducing more features into the archive. And it would be the thin end of the wedge for getting user involvement. And it would be the thin end of the wedge for building a community of practice. So why can't we do this now? I'll move on. Oh, we're nearly finished. Nearly finished. So I'm going to compare the two words, access and accessible. And remember that the word accessible can be said in a tone of voice, a slightly quizzical tone of voice, for example, or a, I'm saying this with confidence, but I don't really know. So there's one statement, our documents, website and software are accessible. Well, we certainly want them to be. And that's certainly not a statement we want to be false. But in some sense, it's the wrong statement. The restaurant can say our food is delicious. Or they can say our clients love our food. These are different statements. Now, I think we need to move some of us, and in particular to deal with these things in the case studies, some of us need to move more to the language about people. People with disabilities read our documents. That's good, we've provided access. Access our service. 
People generally don't access a website, they access a service that the website provides. One way to make a website a service accessible is to give phone contact. If you can't use this site, phone this number. That may be the best solution in many situations. People with disabilities use our software. That's very different from this software being accessible. And every day on the visually impaired programmers list, people, add, people on the list ask new people, people new to the system say, is this software accessible or is there accessible software for doing such and such? And people who have used it say, yes, it is accessible, I use it. Or no, it's not accessible. Or I have these problems, this sort of thing. So it's the people with disabilities who access the service. Our task is to make things that are accessible, but the criteria for success is that people with disabilities access the service. And it might be that the software is accessible, but there's some problem with finding the right page or some instructions missing. But the big difference is that the first statement is thing focused. Um, so, um, and the second statement is person focused. If you're not clear on the difference between a thing and a person, you can buy a thing, you can sell a thing, it's generally not a crime to damage a thing. A thing has no standing in law. A person, since the abolition of slavery, can't be bought and sold. And we are people. So I'm asking for access and accessibility. And the access is person focused. So I'm going to repeat what I said before from Jonathan Godfrey. I'll just repeat it. He said I'll label it. He'll say he, I'll keep doing it and I'll follow Jonathan's advice. We as disabled people need access to information much more than we need access to a specific file format. And the example of this slide in this talk shows that the person will be wanting to use a tool that has to have available the information and the appropriate tools for handling the information. But the information first and then the tools. The information provides the accessibility. The information provides the accessibility. The tool provides the access. And as before, access to information although we've had a lot of improvements, is our Achilles heel. So we have to be aware, we have to be aware. Things are creeping along and changing. I'm getting older by the day. I'll finish with more from Jonathan. This relates to the archive abstract tool. And I think that was a big motivation for my thinking on that problem. Tools that are right under people's noses or automatically applied in the background just don't get as much traction as tools that are. And he also says, something has to change in the very way people use LaTeX if we are ever to get truly accessible PDF documents. Now, there's one thing that's better than me giving you quotes from Jonathan Godfrey, which is you getting to talk with Jonathan Godfrey. And he is available, although he lives in New Zealand, so his time zone is inconvenient for many of you. And at last year's Tech, Com Tech Tug Conference, uh, I did a sort of guided interview with Jonathan Godfrey and oh, Jana Schroeder, who is an applicant for the Holman Prize, a disabled a prize for disabled people to do things. And we had a conversation and I, I just let them make the running. And if you want to meet two disabled people through watching a video in a STEM context, 
I recommend that video and I can't, uh, you'll, you, you'll, you'll find it somewhere. It's in last year's conference. So, thank you. I haven't been looking at the chat, but I know there is stuff in the chat. Yes, the discussion has already started. That's a, uh, first, thank you for your talk. Uh, that's a topic that needs more and more consideration, I think. Uh, that's really important and that's easy to forget uh, and not to pay enough attention to that. Um. And I think you can react to things that have been posted in the chat. And also uh, people can ask to speak uh, because I can see some person that are already in, like, involved. In, I'm going to uh, stop sharing so that we can see each other better. Is the sound better? Yes. So you have a look at the as a chat, and because some persons have already uh, posted things, I guess you know some of the projects that I mean. Uh, R five, uh, R five, I think. The, 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 how do you pronounce? Um... Yeah, R five will do. I, I understood it. So if people want to react or comment. I, 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 I've had a look at it. I had a look at it in one of my own papers. And uh, one of the things that impressed me was that it gave me a great big scroll. It didn't have any of these ugly page breaks in it. It worked, it worked very well because I like to write things in numbered paragraphs. And so I don't need page numbers because my unit of composition is a paragraph, which might be a paragraph is something you can read and try to understand in five minutes. So in mathematics, it might be four lines. And I was, I was pretty impressed by, 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 by what I got. Um, and I think it's well on the way to becoming uh, a standard tool. Uh, it only produce, uh, at present, only shows the first version. Um, so yes, uh, it, it's late XML has come a long way in this time period. I think one of the lessons is that we can, as a community, do practically anything, but it can take a very long time. Yeah, I'm happy for this to become a general discussion on accessibility until Rohit arrives. Um, uh, I, I think the next talk is a uh, council. Uh, I can see that point is connected, but uh, he sent an email telling that he was not able to make it. Huh? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm checking. I will uh, send an email to Hoyt, but for now we have time. Huh? So we can start a general discussion. Uh, hello, Jonathan. This is Kaveh speaking. Thank you very much. It, it, very fascinating talk and something I'm, I'm very interested in. Uh, firstly, can you hear me, Jonathan? I can, Kaveh, and it's very nice. I can't see you, but it's very nice to hear you. Yeah, no, I think you... Oh, hang on. I think someone... Well, it's, it's, it's just... A... I'll switch my video on. I don't know if it's good enough. It's, um, you're coming. There we are. You're a prisoner with a striped shirt. This is it, yeah. Um, so firstly, oh, firstly, sorry for missing your talk yesterday. I couldn't make it. And and thank you for all the work you've done for, for tech. Every single week you've got you've got something going and um, coping with the, some 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 sort of attacks against you as well, unfairly. So thank you very much for that. Um, but coming on to the accessibility couple of points but one the one as you were hiding that um, that uh, uh, your your slide and I think you were saying you were sort of saying that we can't see the slide you know you might if, if, if you're blind therefore you, you're talking I found that the, the and you were saying the competition between the, the site and and the and and yeah can I, can I come but can I make my disclaimer that I should have made then? Go on, which, then. which is I, I haven't tested this theory on any blind people. And oh. I'm not a psychologist, a neurologist, or a user experience expert. 
Yeah. So caveat emptor. Okay, that's fine. And, and I'm not uh, either. <laughs> but uh, this, the interesting thing was this. When th this, uh, what you were saying about the, the, the com competition for I and, and reading and for, for, for uh, if you like, for listening, even if you are fully sighted, if you're not, if, if you're not disabled in any way, that is a problem. Um, I found that when you were speaking, I was listening to you and I understood it perfectly and it all made sense. And I was imagining in my head that, yeah, it really makes sense that Braille, if I'm uh, 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 the, uh, the Braille uh, touch, if you like, does not compete with listening. I actually thought, it was clearer to me when you were talking and there was no slide because you put the same information as sentences almost on the slide. So I'm listening to you, but I, I, want, I don't want to miss what's on the slide either. So it's distracting me. It's taking the power away from what you were saying. This is a more general point, if you like, uh, in that. So I would say if you're putting, it's better if people put on slides very, very brief bullet points, if you like, remind us to yourself, so that I don't have to read the same thing as you're saying. Of course, you know, some people actually write exactly what they're saying, and they read it off there, which is, which is, which is, you know, again, more, more distracting. But that was one point I was going to make. That, that, that uh, um, Thank you very much for sharing your experience. It's 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 just a uh, yeah yeah so, so that's a gen general point and it's and it's great that and I found it was really clear as you were saying it I understood it and it makes sense and I'm <clears throat> going to think about it. And another point is that I am interested in accessibility. In fact, I'm one of the few people who attended a few years back in Milan a conference called um, uh, uh, um, uh, Math for the Blind specifically. And half of the people were actually blind. It was very, very interesting. Um, now, so I've befriended a, a, a blind guy who, who lives down the road with his, with his guide dog. Um, and we're having coffee uh, last, last, uh, last weekend. And it's just really interesting to see, you know, how they see the world, as it were. And he was saying that he learned Braille, of course, at school. He's a, he's a, you know, he's a sort of middle-aged man, but he lost his sight when he was 12. But he was saying at school, they don't teach Braille anymore. I was absolutely astounded. Do you happen to know that? Because he was saying that Braille is considered, um, because there's so much uh, uh, text to speech, they think Braille is not needed. But he, was, he agreed with me, or I agreed with him, that Braille is important because it's, it's a bit like, text not not learning to read because you've got audiobooks um and and of course if people do, if, if it's true that kids are not being taught braille that means they don't have that other sense that of touch that you were saying i i can't say for sure but you know this is this is a you know blind guy who's quite you know a, a, um uh, uh, quite, quite he knows what's going on, if you like, in, in that world. Anyway, those are just a couple of points I wanted to make. I'll say a little bit about Braille readers. Um, I thought screen reading would be wonderful uh, before I'd had any contact with what blind people actually do and work around things. Uh, the accessibility officer at the Open University when I was there, Jeff Bashton, I heard him conduct a meeting. He knew where everybody was in the room. Mm -hmm. and he was able to address people. And he had a Braille reader, a Braille mm -hmm. keyboard, like a Braille screen it's called, which allowed him to read his prepared notes. Uh, Jonathan Godfrey, when he speaks, speaks in complete sentences and well thought out statements um and i think that's probably a consequence of having to deal with a um what's the word it's an accommodation he's made if you like um sorry that was my timer I was saying i should stop talking um on the blind programmers list there is frequently a discussion about braille readers and somebody, and it's a professional tool, 
And it's certainly tax deductible and they're expensive, they're mechanical things and they can wear out and they need maintenance and stuff. And one person was really looking forward to getting the new version with 80 cells, I think it was, it said. Uh, and they're tremendously important if you're trying to spot the missing comma or the colon that should be a semicolon or any of those things. Um, I've, I learn a lot. I, people, of particularly beginners, sort of come in on the on the blind programmers list saying, "What's wrong with this piece of what's where, where's the syntax error?" Um, and it's hard work because they can't eyeball it in the same way. So they have the cognitive burden. When you look at a piece of code or piece or typeset book, the the, the visual cortex, if you like, provides a sort of short-term memory. I'm, again, I'm not an expert in this. That's the way I understand it. So, so there are a lot, lot of factors there. I'm, I'm a great... When I understood what cognitive burden was, I became a great believer in reducing it. I'll stop at that point and maybe somebody else would like to come in. Please do. There are 29 participants, it says. And a few one on, and 11 on YouTube that can make comments on. Ah, oh, there's something in chat. There's a hand up from Dan. Oh, Diane is... Um... Oh, can you say that on the video, Diane, so that the people who will listen to it on YouTube know that? Um... Yeah. Yeah, you sh 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 share your stuff as well if you want to. Oh, we can't hear them. He wants that his mic might have been... Yes, his, his mic doesn't work, huh? but... Uh, so. Oh, I, I use Linux. I, I use Linux, Diane, and I... Don't use the Linux Zoom, I use the web browser. I found it more reliable. Um, by the way, I do, as Garvey mentioned, I do run a tech hour every, most weeks, uh, Thursdays, 6.30 UK time. And Diane and Bruce Miller of the LaTeX ML project came along and we've had some visually impaired people come along uh, we do all sorts of things. Rohit came along, Rohit Goswani came along a couple of, well, last week, I think, and showed us what he was doing. Um, and I'll, after this conference, I'll be going around talks that sound interesting and invited the speakers to come to the Tech Hour as well. It's a very small group, so you get lots of opportunity to listen and talk, but I hope to make it larger over time. We're very friendly, and Nelson Beebe, who's uh, one of the stalwarts of the tech community, who goes back to magnetic tape and um, wrote um, the DVI drivers, for example, the, the PK drivers for um, print. Uh, he, he's a regular attender. Kim Nesbitt Kim has got a hand up. Yes, I allowed him to speak and, and to even to use his camera. Uh, question, is there support in LaTeX for Braille math? Uh, yes and no, I wouldn't like to give an answer. Um, the breast Braille I know of comes from the Pretext project, which is I think PR, um, 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 which is 
Rob Beezer and other people, and they, they were speaking at last year's TUG conference. So it might be helpful to collect the um, conference talks by theme and so forth in the same way that the tugboat articles are collected by theme and author and date. Boris has got his hand up, but I'm happy for yeah, you to talk. Uh, uh, there, there was Kim first, I'm sorry. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you. I unfortunately had to miss part of your presentation, but I will be waiting patiently to see it again on YouTube. So thank you very much. And I hope everybody can hear me okay. I'm on a uh, in a kind of a noisy environment. Uh, I'm a uh, copy editor and translator. I'm in uh, Ottawa, Canada. And I do a lot of work in LaTeX um, with authors who submit their papers to, uh, to the journals I work on. And uh, I also have a vision impairment. And so I'm extremely interested in accessibility and uh, plain language. And I really appreciate you talking about cognitive uh, cognitive load. It's one of the things that, as a, an accessibility professional now, that I've started to get into that world and looking at getting certified. Um, it's really, really something that it helps everybody. And I so appreciate that you brought that up. So thank you very much for uh, for your talk. And accessibility is a huge um, a huge aspect of what I do every day and all of the trials and tribulations. I also do work for the government of Canada. So all of our content needs to be accessible. And so I help my colleagues do that. Um, and I, I just wanted to say thank you very much for all of the accessibility related talk that's been going on in the conference. Uh, I may one day have to rely on assistive technology to continue doing my work. I have some right now, but not a lot. Um, and I would also, just because I'm I'm on the floor here, I'd like to make a little plug for when presenters anywhere in the world at any conference, um, just to consider increasing the size of your pointer and changing it to a higher contrast color whenever you're doing presentations and require us to follow along on a screen. It really, really, really helps a lot, not just for me and people like me with vision problems, but most of us who have, you know, as we get a little older, our eyes get a little weaker and uh, it, it creates less cognitive load, in fact. <laughs> so uh, just my little plug, but Jonathan, I really like to thank you for, uh, for the work that you're doing and uh, to everybody for the conference. It's been great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your sharing about yourself. I've got a question, which is, how did you learn about the conference? I'm a TUG member. I went to, um, actually, when I started working on uh, this economics journal that I do, uh, I was just told all the papers are pretty much word, they think. And lo and behold, when I got the first issue of papers to do, it, 90% of them were in tech. So I immediately had to learn how to use it and of course immediately took three years before I came fully proficient enough to uh, fix everything that comes in in 40, 50 or 60 papers a year from people of all different uh, abilities <laughs> and styles. So uh, that's how I came to learn about TUG and all of the resources and then I attended the conference in person in Toronto one year and have been a member ever since. So um, that's how I came to know about TUG. First, out of a requirement, and second, because now I love tech <laughs> and TUG. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. This, is, this has pleased me a great deal. And I hope we'll exchange email addresses at some point. Um, we got- That'd be lovely. Diane and Boris. If Boris is brief, otherwise Diane is what I suggest. Well, uh, a couple of things I promised uh, to answer. I try to, I'll try to be brief. Uh, first about the question about LaTeX to Braille math. Uh, I want to plug in the great project LaTeX to Nemet, which, uh, which is translator, uh, translator from LaTeX to Nemet uh, math uh, notation, which was uh, recently uh, uh, completed by Andreas uh, Absalors and 
Antonis Tsolomitis, I hope I pronounce their names uh, right. And uh, by the way, I was wrong yesterday when I said that we uh, did not recently spend accessibility fund because I'm really proud to say that part of this uh, great translator was paid from the uh, tech user group accessibility fund. And second thing I wanted to mention again briefly is that uh, besides uh, accessibility of the products created with tech, there is accessibility of tech itself. Uh, Common line you, uh, things like tech are of course uh, accessible because there are very good, uh, very good equipment to use um, uh, to use this common line. Uh, with the situation with the IDEs like tech shop or tech studio is worse. Uh, well, my favorite ID Emacs uh, has Emacs Speak, which makes it uh, completely accessible. And again, I want to plug a work which was done by uh, Kiran. Uh, you might see him yesterday, and me on uh, creating so-called repeat statement for tech, where uh, we basically officially said yes, most of tech uh, uh, and friends are accessible. And this uh, opens uh, the uh, way to use it for in government uh, work for many countries uh, in Europe and United States. So uh, this is another thing we, uh, want, uh, I wanted to tell. Thank you very much, Boris. I think the floor is yours, Diane. Diane. If you want it. Diane? Let me see if uh, you hear me this time. Hello. Yes, sir. we can hear you. Wonderful. So Chrome indeed worked. Thank you, Jonathan, for advising me to switch to the browser. And also thank you for the great talk and uh, just driving so much motivation towards accessibility. Uh, so to mention R5 briefly, uh, that's a fresh site from this year based on 15 years of LaTeX ML work, as Jonathan mentioned. And uh, it's, it's my delight to say that Archive has embraced it. Um, and I also apologize that they will not have video right now. Uh, so Archive has embraced it, and we are actively discussing future plans for making Archive accessible through this HTML uh, interface. Uh, now, to backtrack a step from there, I really loved uh, Ross Moore's talk uh, tonight for me. Uh, it was in the middle of the night, uh, where he displayed the complexity of dealing with uh, tech-based alignments. And you can do all kinds of tabular constructs, diagram constructs. But this complexity that he showed there really extends into uh, mathematical syntax. And to, to the worst case, it may extend to advanced LaTeX packages for column layout. Uh, a lot of work is being currently done by the LaTeX 3 team on this, I, I understand, which is wonderful. But you basically have uh, a need to bypass the complexity of LaTeX with something like tag PDF that Ross uh, showcased, which is one approach, uh, something like the plain text normalization for the abstracts, so Jonathan mentioned uh, archives abstracts. They have this plain text form with the LaTeX equations kept in, uh, pretty much heuristically kept in, and then MathJax gets to make them accessible. So that's another approach. And the third approach is what R5 is doing, which is trying to convert the entire article, the entire LaTeX document mm. into HTML, and then use the MathML uh, standard. So I just wanted to make a very big, uh, very brief plug that uh, there's active work going for MathML4, uh, and a big part of that work is called MathML Intent, which is a special extension to the presentation branch of MathML to add accessible information for the formulas. And what we're trying to do is get some synergy there so that we can emit from all kinds of converters. I think I also work on a MathJax extension for this, that you can emit this MathML Intent syntax and make it directly available to screen readers so that uh, the whole complexity of tech just is uh, completely concluded by the time the accessibility suit, the accessibility technology gets to ingest the document. And if we have this clean separation, we can solve the technical problem and then we can get to the users. And I really like what Jonathan emphasized, uh, talk to people with accessibility needs, make sure the documents have high fidelity, make sure that they actually are consumable by users. And I, I'm, I'm anticipating next year and the year after next, we'll be doing this for archive uh, extensively. So yeah. That's it for me. I, th I think I've got something to say, which is another case study, and then it'll fit into other matters. So at a recent tech hour, somebody sort of came from nowhere, first time they were on the blind math list and they thought they'd come along. 
Um, they work in a small community college in Oregon. They're a student support officer, one of these people that takes advantage of the Chaffee Amendment. Um, he's the only one of them in the college. Um, he asked, is there a beginner's guide to LaTeX? And at that time, he hadn't told me who he was and what he was doing. And when I found out what he was doing, I realized that an ordinary guide to LaTeX would not be good for him. It would be very bad for him because he doesn't want to write a thesis. He doesn't want to write a paper. It may be that um, a student needs to read half a dozen equations that appear in a nursing book or an economics book or something like that. It could be something as basic as that. And I wanted to write a case study, which is a beginner's guide to tech, but for people who provide student support in the small colleges. And any advice that begins with download and install has to be thrown away. They don't have time for that and they frightened of problems, there will be problems. So making things available on the web is really important. The web service can be, I think, a godsend. And you know, you can get Linux running in the browser very slowly, but it runs. And you can um, download and run OpenOffice in your browser. It's not, it's not a web service, it's actually running in the browser combined, compiled to WebAssembly. So all of these things with modern computers can actually be run in the browser. And that greatly reduces the barrier of entry because if the person only wants one formula, they only want to spend five minutes, three minutes of which is devoted to learning LaTeX and two minutes of which is devoted to doing the formula. So partly because my predilection and partly because um, I don't have many resources and they're spread very thin, my focus is on small projects that seem to take things forward. And I think I also have some sort of liking for organizing meetings and trying to develop communities. Um, so that relates to Braille. These questions about Braille are best put in many cases in a beginner's guide to tech for student support officers, specialized FAQ or beginner's guide. I've got something for Kim. Uh, as long as I'm wearing my glasses, my eyesight is pretty good. But as a retirement present, present uh, I bought myself a 40 inch TV, which I use as a monitor, it's a 4K thing. So right now I'm about six feet from my monitor. And um, uh, it's tremendous for me. And, um, Six, um, a 40 inch TV or 40, 55 inch TV isn't that expensive now. So I'm really glad I've got that. And if you've got a visual impairment, it might, might work well for you. That said, um, a lot of the software we have don't work properly with it because of things like um, scaling of pointers and so forth. Uh, there's one more comment, which is the case study I did of table alignment of header cells. Uh, one of the interesting things about that case study was there's a thread on the accessibility list and Rossmore didn't contribute. Rossmore wasn't there. Um, there's probably a good reason and so forth, but um, uh, that's the sort of thing that can sometimes be missed. You look at the technical side of it, but you don't look at the human side of it. I'll stop, I've said enough. Thank you for the discussion. That's really nice to see uh, things going like that. Huh? Are there, is there a last question or remark? Uh, quick from me. Firstly, hello, Kim. Great to meet you again. I, we, we were, I remember you well from the uh, Toronto conference. 
um, and uh, remember your first time at the Tug conference. Um, and uh, Jonathan, you said that the other Jonathan had said that uh, people should use uh, LaTeX better. Can you give a, a, a sort of elevated pitch of how people should use LaTeX better? Okay, I think that is something that we should invite Jonathan to share with us. Um, he actually doesn't use LaTeX. He uses the Markdown suite provided by R. He writes all this stuff in R. He uses R as a statistician. He writes all this stuff in Markdown. He proofread it in HTML. And the PDF is generated via LaTeX, but he never sees it. And if the LaTeX is wrong, then as far as he's concerned, it's a system fault. Because it's because he's written it right and he's proofed it right. Um, he did use LaTeX and he does work, has used LaTeX for HT. Uh, I wouldn't like to paraphrase his views on this. What he said was something has to change in the very way people use LaTeX if we are ever to get truly accessible PDF documents. So I think he's saying that there has to be change in the user, in, in, in the authors, and uh, Frank Mittelbach and the other LaTeX people agree with that. They say there will be various things that the authors will have to do, but it won't be very hard. Um, and um, I think that is, I, I, I really think there should be a dialogue with Jonathan Godfrey and other people. Um, I'm, I'm down on LaTeX for, for, for other reasons. The first reason I got down on LaTeX was that tech can be run as a callable function, but if you run tech as a callable function, it's completely incompatible with LaTeX because LaTeX, uh, so to speak, has no security. Um, but uh, I think the thing is to schedule a discussion with Jonathan Godfrey and people he recommends. And the tech hour is one way to do that. Mm. I can host up to about 25 people if if yeah, I'd, I'd be yeah, I'd be very interested in that. Uh, I'm I'm guessing it, it just we, we should use LaTeX in a more structured way. Right, right. There's a, we all know the good ways and bad ways, but I mean, LaTeX is, you know, it's very old. So there was the idea of structured documents was 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 not even thought about then. Uh, um, uh, so so I'm, yeah. So, so I'll, share, I'll, share, I'll share something with the manager I had at Cambridge University Press, who was one of the first members of UK Tug, an early mm -hmm. member of UK. They produced dual outputs of various things through a specialized system. And he said, the only way you can guarantee that your second output is of high quality is if the production process, and in particular what the author does, relies on the use of that second output. So if the, one of the outputs is never seen by anybody, the quality will be poor, almost invariably. Um, I would say that good LaTeX is LaTeX that conforms to a machine standard. Because the big difference in the world today is that most of our documents are read many times by machines and not very often mm -hmm. by people. So one of the most important machines reading a web page is the Google web trawler. And if the Google web crawler can't properly understand your document, it goes to the bottom of the, it doesn't get the, the search hits it deserves. And the, the same goes for all manner of things. So, um, 
and the previous talk about machine translation that's a machine reading the document mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the last thing you want is your machine reading the document and it falls over because there's a missing angle brace or some ambiguity in the standard or whatever so i think that whatever latex is it'll have to be rigorous and i'm hoping that things like latex ml will in time become a force that brings about rigor thank you but that's me you see and i'm a, i'm only a developer it's it's the users that should have the primacy here though it's hard to remember that sometimes time to stop well, thank you all for the interesting discussion and then the initial talk of uh, of Jonathan. We will have a break uh, and next talk will be in 24 minutes with the interview of uh, John Liz Miller, the co-founder of Overleaf. Thank you to all and see you in 24 minutes.